And one of the things is, before we pray and get into the study for us to understand is, is Good Friday is good, but it's good in a very solemn way. Because it's not good like goody-goody, oh, this is fun. It's good because God had a plan that was painful. God had a plan that was hard. And God had a plan that involved his engagement in becoming a part, in a sense, of his creation by incarnating and coming and living a life even during a troublesome time. One of the reasons why so many people follow Jesus around and they would scatter when he would say something tough is because they were really looking for physical, the physical signs. They had a lot of hope in that. One, they were oppressed by the Romans, and the Romans were harsh. And it was radical, and, and people were being crucified as an example. And sometimes innocent, very innocent people besides Christ were being crucified as an example. Don't cross us. But beyond that, with all our medical advances, for us... Things like infant mortality are nothing. Uh, you know, it, it's almost nothing compared to, to how it was back then. Oh, it's believed that, that up to a half or po- perhaps even more of the children that were born in that day died before they, they became toddlers. And just for me, a few months ago, I got an infection. I had to be hospitalized. And it didn't really hurt other than when they squeezed it and poked and prodded. But other than that, it didn't really hurt that bad. But it very well could have killed me. But I was saved by a round of antibiotics. If I lived during that time, I would have died. There, there would have been no way to be saved. And so people would die commonly just, just by getting a virus, just by getting an infection in their skin. And so when Jesus healed, they, they were follow, he was just someone that they were radically following. But they had a greater sickness, and I keep on repeating this because it fits so much today. We've had a, a virus that has shut down commerce. It's, in a sense, stopped the world. And, and it's a virus that isn't always fatal, and in fact, it's rarely fatal. At the same time, it's easily caught. But we have another virus, and it's called sin. And it is 100% fatal unless you get the antidote. And the antidote's found in the Word of God. And and so what we're looking at tonight is the fact that the cross is the antidote. And and the, the, the title of tonight's message is, He Bore My Sin. He Bore Our Sin. He is the one that died for us. So let's go ahead and pray, and we'll get into the study on this Good Friday. Dear God, as we come before you to celebrate in an odd time that's hard to celebrate in the sense that we're not with each other in a way that we normally are. The churches are normally fuller than ever during this time, and people are being baptized, and we, we see salvation, God, and we know that you can do that through the internet and, and, and through various individuals that reach out. And We know that you can, but Lord, we're not seeing it with our eyes. It's hard to celebrate, but may we focus tonight truly and celebrate truly what the cross means. That our sins are not to be taken lightly. That there are ramifications to the fact that you died for our sins, Lord. And may we truly understand this Good Friday evening that you, that Jesus bore our sin. In Jesus' name, amen. So he bore my sins. So who is he? Well, Jesus is the one who died for my sins. A few things about him. He who died for my sins is eternal, even though he came in the flesh and lived as a human, was born and died in the flesh. He's always existed. Micah 5 verse 2 says, but you, Bethlehem, Epaphrath, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. One's going to come who existed prior to his coming, is what that is saying. And so he is eternal. It also reveals in the scripture, this one that died for us, he is God and he is our creator. That's found in John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 and 3. It says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God, and the Word was God. That word is an interesting word there. It's the word logos, which means the knowledge. 
He is the container of all knowledge. And who has all knowledge but God himself? He is the omniscient one. And Jesus was the knowledge of God. You have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. And they are all, all knowledge, all logos, all wisdom. And it says he was in the beginning with God. So this logos was God. And later on in verse 14 of John chapter 1, it says, And the Word became flesh. The Word became flesh. The Logos became flesh. And we beheld His glory. The glory as of the one and the only. And then it says also that He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him. And without Him, nothing was made that was made. Now, people will argue with, well, Jesus was the first created. No, He is the creator of all things, because anything that has been made was made through Him. Therefore, he himself was not made logically. Now, my notes are a little bit messed up here, but that's what happens when you're not good at these things, <laughs> like PowerPoint. But anyways, he is also glorious. So he is our creator, but he is glorious. It says in John 17, 5, And now, O Father, glorify me with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Jesus was just as glorious as the Father in heaven. He is glorious, and he set aside that glory, kept his character, and came in the form of a man. So he's eternal, he's God, he's our creator, and he's glorious. He's also sinless. This is the one who bore our sins, and Peter called him the sinless, the sinless, spotless lamb of God. Now, what else do we know about him? He's incarnate. I've already spoken of this a few times, but he came in the flesh. And so this God creator who existed prior to anything existing, this essential one, this one who was perfectly fine without all this, without all this, uh, without uh, this creation, he, he creates this place for us to live that actually has time and gravity and and, and, and quarks and neutrons and all these other things in this universe. And, and he built us for his good pleasure. He put it together. And when he put these creatures that he desired to have fellowship with, he said, you can do anything, but, but don't do this. Just one thing. And, and if you don't do this one thing, what's going to happen is you're going to have fellowship with me, and it's going to be incredibly wonderful. But what did they choose to do? That one thing. They sinned. They broke that perfect fellowship with a perfect God. And now they're static in the line, and that relationship is cut off. They spiritually were alive, and then all of a sudden, they're spiritually separated. But God says, I will bring a sacrifice. And so he sacrifices that first sacrifice there, and he covers over their nakedness. So there's somewhat of a relationship. But this is the blood of an animal as opposed to the blood of the sinner, The wages of sin is death. The wages of their sin was separation from God, a lack of spiritual life and eventual physical death on top of that. And so he already had a plan because mankind had sinned. He knew he would have to step into the program. He would have to step into mankind as a man to die for man because no man could die for the sins of the whole world because every single man had the death sentence on him. Everybody had to pay their own sin. Someone had to come along who could pay all their sins. So God decided that he, at the very beginning, when that first sacrifice was made, it was going to point to him. It was going to point to Jesus Christ stepping into the world in the flesh as a man to experience life and to die for all of mankind, even though he had no reason that he would have to die. The wages of sin is death. He didn't, die. he didn't sin, so he shouldn't have had to die. So he came in the flesh. It's known as incarnate. Well, have had a chili con carne. Chili with flesh is what that actually means in the Latin, right? And, and, and so he came, he incarnated, he came in the flesh. Philippians 2, 6 through 8, it says, Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself to obedience to God and died a criminal's death 
on a cross. So he came as a man. And he didn't come as this glorious earthly king with all its trappings. He came into a humble place with humble parents, and he lived life so that he could die for the lives of men. And therefore, he is also Savior. We know why Jesus entered our earthly world and took on human flesh. Jesus said, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. And so he came to save that which is lost. So often people quote John 3.16. But what about John 3.17? It tells us he didn't come into the world to condemn the world. The world's already condemned. He came into the world that the world through him might be saved. He didn't come as condemner. He came as savior. And he came to save us. So he, he is all these things, all these things. He bore, this is the one who took our sins. Who is he? Eternal God, creator, glorious, sinless, incarnate, and savior. And so as we come upon this Easter season, we need to understand that Jesus' death took place during the celebration of Passover. And sometimes we let that kind of skip over our psyche. But in all reality, he's fulfilling this religion, these ceremonies that God had brought to point people to Jesus. He is the Passover. He is the absolute fulfillment of the Passover The Passover lamb was slain that families might not fall under the curse of the angel of death. They would sacrifice a lamb, and they would show God by sacrificing that lamb, we believe what you said, and we're going to do what you said. We believe you, and therefore a corresponding action takes place. That's the only thing that saved the people in Egypt. Now, I'm willing to bet that a few Jewish families didn't believe. And what would have happened to their firstborn? Their firstborn and their family would have faced that curse, that angel of death, because they didn't believe. And there was also, I'm sure, a few Egyptian families that did believe the words of Moses. And so what did they do? They sacrificed a lamb, and they put the blood on the doorposts, and they wouldn't have faced death. What does God call us to do? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, And you will be saved. He is the lamb that takes away the sin of the world. We make it so complex because we take our our traditions and we take our, our, our particular theological secondary doctrines and we shove them on everybody like we're the ones that know everything. And we forget to tell people the basic message. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are saved. And you can call yourself a McDonald hamburger. Doesn't mean you are. But the word of God says... You believe on me, and you are saved. And so you can give yourself whatever title you want, but if you truly believe in the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, you are truly saved. And that is the message of Passover. Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 53, 5, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes... We are healed. And so he bore. He bore my sins. He bore our sins. There's an old, cool movie called The Rope. And there was a Roman soldier named Marcellus. He was at the crucifixion. And when the soldiers gambled to win the robe that Jesus was wearing, as the Bible states, The movie takes a little bit of liberty, and it shows this guy, Marcellius, makes it up there. He won the robe. He won the roll of the dice, as it were. But through the movie, Marcellius struggles with the guilt of having crucified Jesus because he recognized who he was. And I often wonder about these types of scenarios because as they looked up, they realized truly this was the Son of God, as the Bible reveals. I wonder how many of those Roman soldiers that watched the way that Jesus died are going to be in heaven. Someday we'll find out. And so this Marcellus, he struggles and he's like, oh, what am I I doing? I have the robe of of Christ. And, and, And he thought, I crucified him. 
I crucified him. And, and this robe is a, a reminder. But eventually he meets the apostle Peter and he confesses his sin and he becomes a forgiven believer. But he recognizes that this man bore his sins as he's, as he's holding on to it. And, and we need to be as him and recognize that he died not because of a bunch of jerky, stubborn Jews. He, he, he didn't die because of a bunch of Romans trying to prove a point. He died because we needed him to, or else we would have remained in our sins. And, and I think we've all got to join with this man in the sense of, he died for me. What am I, what am I doing about it? He died for all my sins. He bore my sins. And then there's another movie, my family just watched it today, called The Passion of the Christ. It's more modern. We all know about Mel Gibson, and there was a lot of things in the movie that were more religious than biblically true. There was a lot of liberties taken that, that, that showed the background of Mel Gibson's conservative Catholicism. But it's still a very powerful movie. And, and, and Mel Gibson certainly is not a perfect man, and we hear all the stories, and he's attacked and everything else, but if he knows Jesus, he's forgiven. And, and one of the things that happened during this movie was when Jesus was, be, was being nailed to the cross. Now, this is one of the most graphic movies that portrays Jesus being nailed to the cross. And there's a point that a nail is put to Jesus' hands. And during the movie, or the, the filming of the movie, Mel Gibson actually put himself in the movie by taking the nail in his own hand. And he put it there. And this is actually Mel Gibson's hands. And he's making a statement there. It's not the Romans. It's not the Jews. He bore my sin. He bore our sin. I heard a, a friend of ours, a, a woman, teaching other pastors' wives and, and leaders, uh, female leaders in the church, and, and she said, you women need to know, and I'm not just picking on women, <laughs> but you women need to know that sin isn't cute. Your sin isn't cute. Your rebellion against your husbands isn't cute. It isn't cute. For all of us, our sins are not cute. I like to say, you know, sarcasm is a spiritual gift. But in all reality, when my sarcasm hurts people and when there's a dagger behind it, it's not cute. Even though I may get laughs here, I think I get a tear from heaven. Because we can make our sins cute because we've become so comfortable with them. But if you think about your sins and you think about what Jesus did on the cross, we can all just really place our hand on that spike. One of the things over the years that we've done, and many churches have done it over the years, is during a, a Good Friday service, there's been a piece of wood, and everybody that attends a service is able to come by and take a hammer and hit the nail. Just to remind them physically that Jesus actually came in the flesh and he died for their sins and that they are responsible. We need, I need to continually identify with holding the nail to Jesus' hand on the cross. These are my sins that he died for on the cross, and it's no joke. It's not to be taken lightly. Okay, pastor, you're bumming me out. <laughs> it's hard enough in life, but how are we to respond? Because understand, he died for our sins, but he did it willingly. And he wants us to respond to it. So how do we respond to all this? Listen, live forgiven and live forgiveness. On the cross, Jesus said, or it, it, it records in John 19, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. He's saying it is paid in full. It is done at that point. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. He has paid for the sins. He did something for you a long time ago. 
even though you confessed it to God, you, you may continue to beat yourself up. But the thing is, we're to realize we've been forgiven. But we're also not to keep on condemning ourselves once we've been forgiven. One of the things we feel we have the right to do is to continue to hold a grudge or to be angry at someone who God has forgiven, but we feel the right to not forgive them. What right do we have not to forgive someone? And the thing is, this is true for ourselves, right? I've heard a psychologist, read a psychologist who said, we could nearly empty out mental facilities if we could actually get rid of guilt. You see, we really can't without any type of forgiveness. And people know this. They can tell themselves that truth is, is all relative and that morality doesn't really exist and you're only feeling bad. But the fact of the matter is, God planted eternity in our hearts. He, plant, he planted morality there. When we're bad, we know we're bad, and we can lie, or, lie to ourselves. Now we're just adding another sin to all the rest of the sins, aren't we? <laughs> we just become a liar, and we know we're lying to ourselves. But to receive forgiveness, we completely understand that I am forgiven. We know where we've come from, but we also know that we are absolutely forgiven. The cross is greater than your sin. I don't take sin lightly. I think sin is radical. But I know that the cross and God's forgiveness is more radical still. When I say that someone's a, you know, a, a sexual predator, they can be forgiven. Oh, you don't, you don't take that radically enough. No, I do. Maybe even more than most. But at the same time, I take the cross and the forgiveness that God gives us greater than anything else. And if he can forgive someone else, he can also forgive me. And so we need to receive our forgiveness. We need to thank him for forgiveness. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So receive your forgiveness and thank him for his forgiveness. Now, once you receive forgiveness, you need to learn to give forgiveness. In Matthew 6, 14, right at the end of the Lord's Prayer, it speaks of us seeking to forgive those that have trespassed against us. And then it goes on to say, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive you your trespasses. A Christian who refuses to forgive is not in a good place with their relationship with God, period. And people will tell me, I can't forgive. And I go, are you a Christian? And they say, yes. And I go, well, then you can. And not only can you, you must. You must forgive. Oh, but I keep on picking it back up. We'll keep on forgiving. You just keep on forgiving, and eventually you actually forgive. So in light of what Jesus has done on the cross, receive forgiveness. Next, give forgiveness. And the next thing truly, oops, what did I do? I just turned it off. Okay, sorry about that. We'll get it back on. Oh, there it is. Repent. Repent. Some of us, we need to take a good long look at any sin that we may be currently trapped in. We need to, to, to repent and not take our sins lightly because it is a big deal that Jesus paid for our sins. And that's why he's on the cross. I need to realize it was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. It wasn't the nails. It was love. His love for you demanded that he die in your place. Paul identified with the cross in such a way that it changed the way he lived, and he turned around. Repentance is just turning around. A lot of people get the idea that a walk with the Lord, once you come to a time of, of repenting, is, is, is a, a different fork on the road. It's not a fork on the road. It's the same road. It's either going this way or this way. And repentance is just turning around on that road. 
And so we're in conflict until we repent because there's a part of us trying to go this way and a part of us trying to go this way and we start looking like Elvis on a bad day, right? You know, I mean, we just start jerking around and floundering and unfortunately, we as Christians can live in this state for a long period of time. Listen, you will live in this state of being pulled back and forth. It's a battle and it's real. But learn to repent well and turn back around and get the whole body going in the right direction without being pulled into pieces. So many Christians are stuck and they're not really moving towards Christ and they might not be swimming downstream with everybody else, but they're in a place of limbo because they refuse to repent. On Tuesdays, we pray at 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. and a large part of our prayer is repentance. And it's a beautiful thing because it frees us up to keep on swimming upstream. And there's such freedom. And you think, well, what a bummer. Repent. No, repentance is a key to freedom. And when we look and we keep our eyes focused on what Jesus did for us on the cross, it is easy to go, whoop, wrong there, whoop, wrong there, and just keep on repenting and, 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 and getting on the program with Jesus. Paul wrote, in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Do I believe that he has saved me? Then I need to turn and walk towards him. Repent, turn around. So turn from your sin and make every effort to stop it. Let him help you stop. He died to free you from your sin. There's a, a funny skit on YouTube, and it's the old Bob Newhart show. And if you're too young to remember Bob Newhart, he's pretty hilarious. But he was a psychologist, and someone comes in, and, and uh, he, he says, well, I'll counsel you. It'll only take a few minutes. And so this woman starts talking about her problems, and he says, well, stop it. And she looks at him, and she's goes, well, just stop it. He just keeps on doing this. Well, stop it. My relationships are self-destructive. Well, stop it. You know, he just keeps on saying, well, stop it. And it's funny because that advice doesn't really work if you're going to a psychologist or a psychiatrist. But when you come to Jesus and Jesus says, stop it, I'll help you and I'll walk with you and I'll change you and I've given you the Holy Spirit and I've given you the power and I've given you the forgiveness and you're not a loser. You're a winner. Yeah, you can actually turn around and you can actually change. And all of history is full of millions and, and tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of people whose lives have turned around because of the power of the cross. And so turn and walk with Jesus and enjoy the fellowship of walking in the light. Now, the Bible mentions three men were dying on the cross this day, this Good Friday, so many hundreds of years ago. And they all had a story to tell. The first cross held a dying thief, and he was dying in his sin. He was dying because of his sin. It says in Luke chapter 24, 39, and one of the criminals who hanged there was hurling abuse at him, saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. He wasn't sorry for his sins. He was angry. Just save me in my sins. But he wasn't really wanting to turn. He wanted to be saved from the punishment for his crimes. But his heart had not changed. He was dying in his sin. Now you had the second thief on the other side of Jesus. And we're going to see that he was dying to his sin. The one was dying in his sin. This one was going to die to his sin. He said, we are receiving what we deserved as he talked to the other thief. He says, we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And later he looks at Jesus and he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus responds to him, truly I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. And guys, if you're a believer, you're dying to your sin not in your sin. If you're not a believer, you are dying in your sin, and you may not be someone on earthly standards under the death penalty. 
but your sins are causing you. If you die, you're going to die in your sins without Jesus. But if you reach out to him, you're going to die to sin and you're going to leave in him or you're going to live in him. And I tell you what, that man could do no good works for Jesus from that point. It was belief that saved him and not good works whatsoever. Now, had he been able to live a life after the cross, you better believe his life would be changed like ours should be changed. And then in the middle, you have a Savior dying for sin. In sin, to sin, and he was dying for sin. He went to the cross for one purpose, to die for the sins of the world. The Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall upon him. Again, Isaiah 53. 1 Peter 2.24, Jesus bore our sins in his own body on the cross. Salvation from sin is only found in Jesus Christ. Matthew 1.21 says he will save his people from their sins. And so that's why this day is good. It's not good because you might have a service and eat a bunch of food. It's not good just because it, you know, it leads to Sunday morning when we can hunt Easter eggs and, again, eat way too much food. I don't know what it is about us in Calorie Chapel, but we just like to eat a whole lot of food. It's good because he died for our sins. And uh, it's solemn. It is a celebration, but it is solemn. And it's a celebration because it's what he wants us to recognize. But it's solemn because he had to do it. Remember tonight, he bore my sin. Remember tonight that he bore our sin. The crucifixion of Jesus is sufficient for all. He died for the sins of the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever would. The crucifixion of Jesus is sufficient for all but is efficient only for those who accept the gift. He died for the sins of the world, for everybody's sin. But that payment is only credited to your account once you believe. Belief is the key to unlock the payment for your sin. And that's what a believer is, plain and simple. The one who has received that payment for their sin. And so if you're listening on the radio, if you're watching on the internet, you have to receive that in order to receive life. There's no other way. It's not about being Presbyterian, Pentecostal, Baptist, or non-denominational. It's about being forgiven. And that's what Good Friday is about. Let's go ahead and pray and we'll close with a song. Dear God, we do thank you so much for your forgiveness. And we receive it into our own lives, Lord. Lord, keep us from beating ourselves up because you've already forgiven us. Keep us for, from throwing up our sins into your face as an excuse not to serve you or to not be used by you, God, because you already know better. In fact, you know better than any of us that you already have forgiven us, God. And we're thankful for that. And Lord, let it be that because we've been forgiven, we can easily forgive others. Lord, we confess we are not good at forgiving others. But, Lord, may we be continually learning more and more how to forgive. And even today, Lord, there may be believers out there who have not surrendered to giving forgiveness and the freedom that it brings, the unlocking of the shackles of the past that it brings, Lord. And I just pray that they learn to be as you, who look down at those that crucified you, that had put the nails through your your hands and your feet. You looked down at those who had whipped you, had arrested you, had, had stripped you, spit on you, mocked you. And Lord, you said, forgive them for they know not what they do. Lord, may we learn to forgive. And may we always understand that as much as we seek to forgive those that who have forgiven or who have harmed us, Lord, We've been forgiven of many more sins than any one person has ever perpetrated against us, God. Again, we are thankful for that gift. And Lord, may we turn, especially in this reminder of a time of those things that truly matter as the world is locked down. Lord, may it be that we just learn to turn 
And after we come out of this, when we come out of this lockdown, Lord, that we would not take the ability to turn and repent lightly, God. We are so incredibly reminded and prompted and, and, and move to make a difference from here on out in our lives, Lord. So help us to turn away from the foolishness that we've been distracted with and the shiny objects and the sinful things that cause us to be disjointed. And Lord, may we wholly with integrity follow you through the ability to repent well, repent fully, repent often, God, that we may walk in intimacy with you. Lord, may we always remember, even as Paul said, that he, he carries around in his own flesh the reminder that you died for his sins, Lord. Lord, you bore my sin. You bore our sin. And for that, we are just thankful, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.